Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to do something different. I have this Patreon thing and... <laughs> okay. Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Uh, today... <laughs> Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I would like to do something different. Like many content creators, I have a Patreon. And a lot of, a lot of people join that and ask me all sorts of really cool questions. So I literally posted a week ago, please ask me questions and I'm going to start making videos and try to answer them. And I was honestly hoping that people would be saying things like, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite color? Easy things. But in fact, everyone wants to know about really deep, deep, deeply technical stuff. So uh, let's just get started. And I'm reading them in the order they were posted. So CD Roy1224 asks, what occupies the space between Saturn and its inner ring? Did Cassini measure confirm any material there? Okay. Um, so yes, Cassini did actually observe material on its final set of orbits. So as Cassini was approaching the end of its life, uh, they started orbiting where it would go all the way out and inside the space between the innermost D-ring and the surface of the planet. And as it went through these, it uh, actually angled the spacecraft so the main antenna was in front of it. And they did find uh, evidence of material in falling in there. We've actually known that there is a ring rain that comes off of uh, Saturn's rings and onto the planet. This was observed from the ground, I believe. And it's actually based on uh, like meteorites hitting more distant rings, causing like a puff of plasma, and then that gets entrained in the magnetic field and actually falls in at higher latitudes. But yeah, we, we know that as you get closer to the planet, you start to get effects of atmosphere and magnetic fields, and the material does in fact fall onto Saturn. So yes, we know that's there, I but I should really do a whole thing on Saturn rings because they are really cool. Okay, David Hodge asks, I would love to learn more about RDEs, rotating detonation engines. What do you know? What can you teach about them? I can actually show you a video about them. And I pr so I made this video about a year ago. Rotating detonation engines are engines where the combustion happens as a detonation front, which means it is supersonic. And that means because the, the explosion, the combustion happens so rapidly, it's a constant volume expansion as opposed to a constant pressure expansion that you see in uh, an, a tr traditional rocket or jet engine. So according to magic thermodynamic graphs, this actually creates like an engine cycle which gets you more efficient, say, and therefore should produce a better engine. Nobody's actually built an engine that works like this. But there are a few, uh, and I cover this in that video. The thing about the rotating detonation engine is the detonation wave is running in a circle continuously. It's, so you're feeding in new propellant as it goes around the loop, and it keeps on detonating continuously. I did see that, I guess in the last year, there was news that a student at the University of Huntsville, Alabama, has a design that they fired up and this is different because it's a racetrack shape i'm not sure if there's anything significant in that but development is ongoing i'm not sure if rdes have actually demonstrated any improvement over any engines at this time okay chris becker asks hello hello i was wondering what you uppercase you think the most technically challenging aspect of the apollo program was it the launching of the first stage Achieving lunar orbit, was it the landing on the lunar surface? So I'm going to say, I think technically challenging is stuff that they had to solve for Apollo specifically. Because if you think about it, on Gemini, they'd already solved the problems with getting to orbit, rendezvousing. They'd already built their first generation computers. I think the computers are amazing, but I don't think they were the hardest problem. Because by the time we get Apollo 11 on the moon... That rocket has four computers and three of them are all different designs. I think the hardest problem they had to solve for the Apollo program was putting people in spacesuits and having them be able to move around on the surface of the moon. And that's actually something that we've sort of stepped back from since Apollo because we haven't had people walking around in gravity. Now we've seen NASA has a new set of suits that they're coming up with for surface operations. Uh, these will presumably be better. They'll use new rotating joints and uh, new new articulations around the arms to give them much more 
freedom of motion. But I think, yeah, that was the biggest thing. And of course, NASA famously worked with outside experts on uh, your clothes or clothing that could contain the pressures involved. That was the International Latex Corporation, better known for making underwear. Okay, Adrian asks... Hi Scott, I'm fascinated by cycler orbits between Earth, Mars and Venus and cycler orbits in general. Lots of pros for interplanetary tra travel. Yes, I would love to make a better video about this. I'm actually waiting on something very specific later this year, possibly appearing on Netflix, which may let me talk a little more about cyclers. I actually have worked with somebody on... Um, a, a movie thing which involves some cycler stuff. And, right, I can't really say much more. But yeah, I did a Kerbal thing a while back just demonstrating the idea. And this was a cycler that went from low Kerbin orbit out to the moon. The idea with a cycler is you have... When you're traveling for long periods of time, you really want to have space to get out and stretch your legs. But it takes a lot of delta V, a lot of propellant to push your spacecraft up to that speed. So giving yourself a huge spacecraft, um, why not have it just stuck on an orbit that never stops? And so you can join this spacecraft, go to Mars, get off the spacecraft and land on Mars while the spacecraft continues. And so you have a space hotel or a cycler. Now, because of because the orbits only align like once every, the, the alignment only repeats every seven or so orbits. You need seven of these if you're gonna go. And when you go out, to Mars and then come back, you will get different cyclers in each direction. They're a great idea if you are running lots of people to and from Mars or Venus continuously. Uh, I'm not sure we'll see those happening, but uh, it's definitely a cool concept. And the other thing is you, you realize you're talking like years, or decades between people checking into these things. So they have to sort of shut down and be uh, good over long periods of time. Okay. Daryl Nelson. Hi, Scott. My question is a very basic one, but one that I have been able to, haven't been able have been able to understand how it works. With the spaceships that travel to the moon, Mars, and other planets, how do they actually navigate? Oh boy. Like, space navigation in deep space is actually... A whole, there's a whole host of things that they, they are doing to try to figure out their position and velocity. They have to consistent... They have to use many, many uh, data sources. So one and one obvious thing is they're working with their orientation using star trackers, but those star trackers can also be used to pick up uh, images of planets. So planets uh, location information can be used to figure out a location within the solar system. So that's that will be important. But if you're wanting to get really accurate locations, you need to use Earth based beacons and if you send a radio signal and get a radio signal back, you're going to get a time delay and you're going to get a Doppler shift. That tells you how far away and how far you're going in radial direction, but it doesn't give you any accuracy in the you know left, right, up, down, right? So that you get two really well constrained dimensions, one or two other or four other not constrained dimensions, right? Because you need speed and velocity. There are other techniques. One is that I was pointed at is called Delta Door, and this is long-haired NASA guy on Twitter. He's he told me to make a video about it, and I've never quite got around to making a video about it because the um, there's a lot of information out there for me to absorb. And what what you're doing in that case, I believe, is you have two antennas, and you're looking at differential information between them, and that lets you get, it's a bit like very long baseline interferometry, except you're doing it with a spacecraft and it gets you much better location information. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other things like this. You can also look at, I, I, I'm not sure this has been done, but this is something that was uh, talked about where you can look at pulsar timings because pulsars are out in deep space and they have, very, very accurate pulse repetition cycles. So by the time that you receive pulses, you could in theory figure out where you are in the solar system, just like GPS is sending uh, their signals with very accurate timestamps. I'm not sure that's ever been used on a spacecraft. This is why I haven't made a video about this because I've got to actually do a lot of research and figure out what's happened. Uh, Mark Bergside is saying, Scott, Orbital Mechanics, where to begin? A reference. Oh my goodness. 
I, I probably don't have a great um, answer to this because what I got was a book. Uh, I might yet actually be here. Uh, no, I don't have it here. I learned at university and I had a book called Orbital Mechanics by Archie Roy, who's an interesting uh, character from you know, Glasgow University's uh, astronomy department. Um, so that's how I learned it. But then once you learn the basics, you, of course, f start finding out all sorts of fascinating stuff about orbital resonances and perturbations and high order J2s and non-spheroidal gravity fields. I think there is a website out there and I'm going to actually link it in the description because I don't want to pause the video while I, I look it up. But I think that's a there's a website that covers a bunch of equations. And I think that's a good one. Maybe I should actually go back and just do like a first course in orbital mechanics. I sort of did this orbital mechanics on paper thing and it was trashy and horrible, but I've heard people that like it. I, you know, it was terrible because I like I made mistakes and I didn't do my units properly and, and I had a hard time doing that. Anyway, I'll, I'll send a link down there, but uh, definitely something to think about in the future. Okay, I think we're over 10 minutes now, so one last question. Riley Adamson asked for a video explaining my career and how you've become so knowledgeable. That would be very interesting. Uh, okay, I actually asked some other ones, so I might not be able to get... <laughs> I might have to start the next one with this. Okay, uh, my career is that I was a space nerd from a young age, and the thing... There was a couple of things that, that worked for me. First of all, I... I obviously liked doing physics at school but then I was really into Dungeons and Dragons and Warhammer and role-playing games and I remember uh, I think it was the GURPS space uh, expansion and it had all these things talking about how to design the spacecraft it included all this math like how to calculate the gravi surface gravity of planets which I sort of knew at the time but uh, you know, it included stuff about specific impulse and rocket engines and I sort of took all that stuff and I started began, you started to design spacecraft. So when Kerbal Space Program came along, I was very much in the right state of mind to be doing these, you know, sci-fi spacecraft designs. Um, but look, I, I, at university, I did physics and astronomy. I did a bit of another thing called computational physics. And then I continued to try to stay in academia out of fear of the real world and studied asteroids and comets. And I never completed that PhD, but I did spend a lot of time working on other related things. Uh, I got my job in tech because I was bored at the, astro uh, the observatory one night and I wrote myself a streaming radio system. Like, it was literally like 15 lines of code. Uh, it used M streamed MP3 radio, and that was actually one of the first MP3 radio stations at the time. Um, but with all the stuff that I do on YouTube, I started playing Kerbal and covering, um, you know, talking about the science of it because, well, Kerbal was a sort of game that I was interested in. I was playing EVE Online a lot and trying to make uh, videos about that. But Kerbal came along and I understood the orbital mechanics so I could talk about that with some authority. But it turns out in some of my Kerbal videos, I made a few mistakes about rocket science and had people correct me. So I really began to start doing my own research to make sure that I wasn't about to say something dumb and incorrect. So I have enough knowledge from what I from the past that I know a lot of this stuff off the top of my head. But when I go and make a video, I make darn sure that everything I'm talking about has a basis in reality. And sometimes I will see a thing that is a great idea to hang a video off. And I'll then have to do hours and hours of research to absolutely confirm that it is true. So I'm not implicitly knowledgeable about all this stuff. What I have is enough knowledge of physics and engineering that I can sniff out the truth in the story I let me see, let me say. And I know where to look to find the answers and know who to trust when I'm find, finding the answers. So I think I get a pretty good hit rate, but... It's really, it's not any first-hand experience building any of this. It is someone who reads an awful lot and wants to tell stories. And with that, I'm going to let you guys go. I'm going to come back for future videos and hopefully I'll get some more easier questions next time. And I will answer your antimatter question, Riley, next week. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>